I'm going to be talking about Delta Lakes in Azure Synapse um, and do a little intro on Delta Lakes for those of you who are not familiar with it and then kind of dive into how to make it go and, and a couple of limitations that um, I'm hoping that perhaps somebody from Microsoft can tell me that are going to go away soon. So we will see. All right, so first off, a little bit about me. As you can tell from the accent, I am not English. I am um, in the States. I live in Arizona, where it is presently 23 degrees Celsius, I think that is. Um, and I'm going to go out and enjoy the sunshine without a jacket uh, later on today. Um, I have been working with Synapse pretty much since it came out. I really enjoy using it. I'm also a data platform MVP, wrote a book last year on cognitive services, and I'm also a Microsoft certified trainer. I am on Twitter way too much, so if you have any questions after this and you want to ping me or make cheap comments, um, please um, tweet me at desertalsql.com, which is also the name of my blog and my email. All right, let's talk a little bit about Delta Lake. So Delta Lake is, of course, part of Spark, and it was created to make a flat file more like a database. So with your data stored in blob storage with Delta Lake, you have the ability to create ACID transactions. Those of us with data backgrounds know that that means that it's atomic, which means the transactions follow an all or nothing rule. And if one part of the transaction fails, then everything fails. Consistency means that it's only gonna be written to the database. And if some reason it violates consistency, the whole thing will be rolled back. It is isolated, meaning transactions will not impact the other ones and durability, of course, means that any transaction committed will not be lost. So um, as part of that, a um, couple of things that are, you know, you can implement within Delta Lake are schema enforcement. Um, as a matter of fact, I ran into this. Um, people just think that they can just blindly write data to a data lake and then somebody can come by years later and analyze it, which is always the goal, which is why nobody wants to throw out any data and everybody wants to get a nice cheap um, Azure Data Lake storage Gen 2, stick it in a folder and have it be there in perpetuity because it costs them very little to do that. However, um, you do need to know what you're putting in there. Um, one of the things that I ran into thinking of schema enforcement, um, I was do, um, asked to do some machine learning analysis on um, water uh, flow transaction information that were being streamed to a data lake. And all of a sudden, um, I had more columns than I knew what to do with. I only had 10 of them defined, and all of a sudden I got 12, and nobody knew what the values in those other ones were, and it also changed some of the other values. So it's really important to know, uh, turns out the reason that that happened was that they got new water meters in and the transaction stream that was being written to the data lake was different in the new model. So who knew? Nobody on, nobody did because nobody was looking at the information on the data lake. With schema enforcement, what you can do is ensure that the um, data being written, assuming you're writing, you know, columnar data is in the format that you are expecting. So if all of a sudden I got 12 columns or maybe all of a sudden I got nine, I could then flag that so that somebody would know that there would be something wrong so you can go fix it at the point of time that it's happening rather than years later when somebody notices that the data is not the same. Really useful reason to use Delta Lake. Another reason is to improve the overall performance. And you can do this with um, compaction. A lot of times when you are streaming stuff, especially if it is something like IoT data, you're ending up writing a lot of little small files. So in Delta Lake, what you can do is rewrite the small files into a smaller number of large files on a regular basis, which will improve the overall query performance because there are less places for it to go look, improve the table reads, and make things go faster. But of course, the thing that people um, hear about quite often is time travel because everybody thinks that this is the TARDIS version of Doctor Who. It is not. It is really just the built that the fact that um, Delta Lake provides the ability to create data snapshots. And with those data snapshots, you can look back in time to see the previous version should the schema have changed or the data changed so that you can query past versions of the current environment. 
The other thing that Delta Lake includes to improve performance is a thing called data skipping. So Delta maintains the file stats on the data in the files. So it knows which ones to read and which not to read. And then it skips over the files that it doesn't need to read, improving your query performance. So with all of that great stuff, of course, you're going to want to implement it. So let's, I want to talk a little bit about my little sample environment that I'm going to be talking about. I've got a whole bunch of student enrollment data. And in my data lake, they are stored in the raw area. So I've got this data. Naturally, I want to create a Delta Lake and specify a folder where I want these files to be. Don't want them necessarily in the same place as my raw data. My raw data is in a parquet format. I also have a lot of data for different years. So I want to work with and partition my data based on the years because I do that. I specify years quite often when I'm doing my queries. Um, so, and I'm also going to want to interact with it in, of course, um, using Python, using um, integration, which is basically um, data factory within Synapse. And I want to look, use um, create a virtual database and use that no matter how I've created my files as well. So that's what I'm trying to do. Um, I am doing something very similar for a customer. So hopefully you also find this to be a um, similar arrangement than how you might be doing it at your customers. So let's talk about the different ways that you can access information in Delta Lake. Of course, you can do everything in Spark. Naturally, uh, Spark is uh, part of um, Delta Lake is part of Spark, so it works very seamlessly with different ways. One thing that is important with Spark, though, as part of its integration with Azure Synapse when you are creating things, is the way that you need to specify the location of where you want things stored. Um, and doing the default will defaultly get the data some random place that you might want it. So I wanted to show you the appropriate syntax so that you have uh, the information where you want it, not just creating stuff randomly in Delta Lake with Spark. Of course, I, once I have created my um, tables and have all of that going, no matter how I have created them, I want to be able to use serverless and be able to query my Delta Lake information using my virtual database. And I don't care if I have how I've created it. I'm going to be using one that I created in um, Python because previously you couldn't do that. So now you can. And for those people who haven't tried doing this since, um, including somebody that I'm presently working with who last tried this in December, it works now. So I definitely wanted to bring that up. And lastly, I'm going to talk about um, integration runtime, you know, the integration portion um, with Delta Lake. This is still in preview. Um, I found something that doesn't work. I hope that changes soon, but until then, I just wanted to bring it to everybody's attention so that you don't, um, you figure out a way to work around it. Um, and basically the workaround is writing code in Spark. All right, so let's talk about Delta Lake in Spark. So of course, um, I'm gonna show you an example using Spark to create Delta tables. I've also created a warehouse using a SQL state, a SQL command in Python. Um, by default, if you do not specify a location for your data, it's going to show up in Synapse workspaces, the name of your um, storage account, and underneath warehouse and DB name. So if you have written a um, your data in Delta Lake format and you're like, where did it go? Because you didn't specify it. That's where it goes. Um, the way that the syntax works presently is it's as um, far as I know, if there's anybody out there who knows a better way of doing it, let me know. But I do it as a two step process so that I um, write it and then I separately specify a table so that I can put it where I want it to go and create a table. If I use the default method, it automatically writes it to that location and creates a table. But if I want to specify a location, that's a two-step process. 
All right, let's talk about how it is to do that and take a look at the code that does this. So what I have here is I have my um, inf uh, student info here and I really should have put this over. I've got all of my data in my ADLF storage container. So this is, a, of course, my data is in blob. And this is all just test data, by the way. I'm not showing you anything super exciting. So I've got my data stored in raw. So if I look at my data, um, where I've got it stored, um, it's just put here in my, here's my student information that I have. My data is stored as Parquet data. Um, so I do not have to do any kinds of additional transformations for that, but I'm going to want to make my raw data into a table in uh, using, um, using Spark. So here I have created, I've got a lake database, which is a um, Python database or a Spark database that I have created. It's listed underneath my workspace database here. And I'm going to create a database within this called Data Warehouse, which you can see that I did here. And then I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that generic method for writing a Delta Lake table in um, with ADLS. So I'm going to go ahead and run this again. As I said, overwrite, so I will be fine. So what this is going to do is it is going to, whoops. Oh, because I put it in the right place. I want it. All right, so what it's going to do is it's going to create my data into move it from um, to Delta Lake format and it's going to save it as student info. So while it's running, let's look at where, because I did this earlier, good, it finished. Let's look at where that ends up. So if we look at my data lake here. Ginger, I mean, could yes. you zoom in a bit? Because uh, oh, Sorry. It's not you. It's the screen quality of the broadcast that is. Well, it's also the fact that I have you. these giant monitors. So thank you for prompting me to do that. And I'm sorry that I didn't uh, see that message in Slack because I was actually focusing. But sorry, thank you so much for specifying that. All right. So underneath here, uh, you'll notice that I've got a folder called Synapse. And under there, Workspaces. And under there, I've got this folder called Warehouse. And this is where it will um, put my information um, because that's the default location. And I told it that I wanted it called student info, which is why this is where my data lives. You can see that it just got written here. Um, it actually happened like I said that it did. So um, I've got my data written here, which is exactly what I specified here. And I will make it now so that you can actually see it. that is easy for your easier for you all to see okay so i've gone ahead and i've written it but it didn't go to any place that i wanted it to go so i want to specify where i want it to go and to do that that's more of a two-step process i'm going to make it a three-step process though because there's i want to create partition data not only because that's a good thing to do but also because I wanted to show you how that works when you're doing integrations. So um, I'm gonna do that so that I can demonstrate how that works. So what I need to do first is notice the difference in code here. Instead of just saying to save it as table and getting the default location, I'm telling it where it needs to go. Um, something I'm sure Mark is familiar with. Um, so you, so 
Um, so being after I tell it where to go, the issue is, is that this is not going to create a table for me. Um, app, um, it's just going to create the location of data where I said that I wanted it. So if I run this, then it's going to be located exactly where I told it to go. I've told it that I want it to go to Delta Spark in the student directory. So if we look at my directory here, instead of going to this location, I'm going to raw match. And the student location is where my data is going to live. So I'm going to, it's not going to be the same. It's just some random place that it went. So um, what, now that I've got my data created in Spark, the first thing, what I'm going to do is I am going to um, create a partition on my data. This is going to allow me to write faster queries upon it. So I'm going to do that. Now, um, well, I have my student info table that I created here. So that exists. But if I, I'm going to create another table, give it a different name so that you know that there's a difference there for my next table. But for, then I'm, first, I'm, then I'm going to go ahead and partition my data, which doesn't take very long. And after it's done, I did this already, so I'm going to show you actual code working. What I'm going to do then is I'm going to then create a table that is going to contain that partition data. And that's going to show up here in my tables. And when I refresh this, now I have my file that is created with my partition data in um, that I created there. So this will work with, should have did earlier. We'll use my previous one. Oh, that's lovely. Hopefully I can get this to work before I do the next portion of this because naturally this worked earlier. All right, so this gives me a table that exists here as a as a as data that is partitioned. So um, and I can also, of course, then create SQL statements on top of it using a magic command here in Spark. And there's no data available. What did I do? Created it. Oh, and I've already existed. The one that I know, the other one that I know worked like. So the one that I created using this method where it automatically just stuffed it someplace. That one's working fine. The other ones for some reason do not have data that's available for them and they did five minutes ago and I'm not sure why. So this is basically the different methods for doing it. Again, if you just use the standard method for getting it into data lake, um, it's going to put your data into this area here. Got my, sorry. I got my data into Synapse, then Workspaces, and then Warehouse. But if I wanted to specify where I want it to go, then I need to be smarter about it. First, specify ex the exact location, and then I added a partition for year, and then created a table off of it, which is said it already existed. If it's happier if I do that. 
So first I have created the location and then I'm telling it where the location is. And then I'm going to um, create a partition on it now saying there's no data available. Which makes no sense. I will debug that before the try to figure out why I don't have any data, but this is why it works better in demo. I guess I didn't sacrifice enough to the demo gods to be able to get that to work appropriately. But this is basically how I would be able to do that. I created it, but I um, which which allows me to create the table. All right, let's talk about some other things with Delta Lake. So when you you can definitely use integration pipelines with, to it, um, you can create a table, then write to it. However, there is an issue with partition tables. Um, it doesn't seem to when you run a uh, a pipeline and you tell it that you want the uh, location of the data to be moved to an area that is partitioned. It doesn't work. Um, it will give you an error if you tell it that you write to a Delta Lake table that is not partitioned, though, it works fine. Now, this is presently a preview feature. Um, so the upserting doesn't seem to work. It seems to presently just do inserts. So let's take a look at that. All right, so I'm going to take a look at my. loading of my partition table. So I have a data flow here and I want to, um, which which ran successfully. And let's take a look at my data flow table here. So what I did is I'm taking um, as a source some raw um, data that is in Delta format. So this is my stream and I want to write it to a um, Delta Lake data set. Let's take a look at this sync here. And I wanted to do an upsert, and um, I want to actually put this into my um, partitioned data. Now you can see that I do have a green check, so this did work fine. When I wrote it to the unpartitioned table, which is student info. But if I try to get this to, and I thought this was running, I was like a demo it. If I try to write to a table that is partitioned, I will get an error. Um, it's not possible for me to write to a partitioned uh, data lake table. If it is not partitioned, like this one is not partitioned, I will have no problems at work fine. So I don't know why that is. Um, I wish it didn't work that way, but it does. The other thing that I have noticed when playing around with using Delta Lake with um, um, data flows is that if I look at upsert, I don't have the ability here to say upsert based on something. Right, so I don't. So it's it only shows me that um, the upsert if is true, but I don't have the ability to um, select a column. So when I run this, it just ends up being an insert. So I, the true upsert functionality isn't something that's presently implemented within Delta Lake. Now I know this is something that um, is in preview. Do I anticipate at a later date that I will have all of the features functionalities with upsert? But at this time, yeah, it doesn't, I don't have the capability of, of implementing this function um, with Delta information. So keep that in mind. Um, of course, the solution to this would just be to basically do your ETL within Python, and then you don't have to worry about any issues regarding um, upserts you can write that in code but uh i have clients that aren't how happy about that all right so that was my demo on it 
serverless. So your, the um, Spark database does support all formats. Um, it integrates with SQL Server so that you, once you've written it, you can write it in um, your notebooks. The reason um, this is a big deal is that this didn't work in December. So I'm really happy to say that it that it works now because that is a improvement upon how the code was um, working earlier in, um, last year. So let's take a look at what I'm talking about and I'll show you what didn't work. And fortunately, it all works now, so it's awesome. All right, so if we look at my data here, I have created a number of different tables um, that interesting that I that that worked like five minutes ago where I could actually query them. <laughs> but as of now, they are not here we go. So here I've created a spark table. I can go ahead and run this. And it works fully in um, SQL integration. So this Lake database is actually, you know, set up to be, you know, Spark specific. This is not the same. Just started. So anything that I create in um, as a as an external table, I can query it as an external table. So I don't have to um, worry about things that are not being created if, if there are you know, other, other methods. Um, like I said, this was something that if you looked at this in December, you did not see because it wasn't fully integrated with, um, the metadata wasn't fully integrated, but since that has changed, I wanted to definitely call that out so that if I create um, some tables using Python and you know, it doesn't matter if they are partitioned or not, I can them. So either way, once I've created them, they're fully integrated as um, all part of a SQL a um, valid name. Obviously, I annoyed the demo gods because that worked and that didn't. And they're both Delta created tables. So maybe it works sometimes and sometimes it does not, but, um, or if you're doing a demo, it works fine until you are actually presenting in front of people. Is but, it a database? What? Is it in a user database or in master? It's, Sorry. oh, good call. Those built in, connected built in. It's because you zoomed in, you can't see the, the bit that should be next to it. Ah, it's in that database, which is where I would expect it to be because that's where this, this is. And this is generated just like this is. So it's telling me that this exists. And it's telling me that this does not. Although it's right here. I think we managed to raise it as a bug. Hmm? Yeah, I'm thinking that, you know, obviously I annoyed the demo gods and now they're like, oh, you wanted to do that? Nah. I, I apologize for, for the entire engineering team. <laughs> yes, because you told them about data toboggan. They're like, oh, we'll mess with Mark. Yeah. So, for, yeah, for I, mean, I don't understand what the issue is. This worked fine. So, but you get the concept and it does it does work when you're not doing a demo which is different than say in December where you, if you created this, it wouldn't work. So good, good times. It, it is a, a great tool um, again because of the performance improvements that you can make. The reason that this is important is that when you've got a lot of data, which I do um, for this uh, in this particular example, which kind of mirrors something that I was doing for a client, anything you can do to improve performance is really helpful. Um, especially is um, I've got a client that's a nonprofit and they do not want to bring up, put up a database, but they want fast queries. So the ability for to create um, parquet files and then 
um, create databases in, in Python and then with um, all the fun things that you can do with Delta Lake implemented it makes this a very workable solution for people who do not want to put up a SQL server database on their data. Um, you can just use Delta Lake because you can get it to perform better than say just straight up um, Spark with Synapse and uh, Parquet files. So, and if you're not doing a demo, it works great. All right. So things to remember, the best implementation of, of um, Delta is in Spark. Um, you may need to write Spark ETL if you have if you ha are trying to write two partition tables, the other things that you could do if you're doing ETL to Delta Lake is you could write to a non partition table and then partition it afterwards. Kind of an annoying step, but you cannot presently not write to a um, partitioned um, file if you're using integration. Um, when Delta is in preview, so hopefully that will be resolved in the very near future. And if you create in Spark, it works great in serverless, unless of course um, you're doing a demo and, and, and people know that Mark's running a, um, something on the weekend. So with that, um, we talked about today the uh, summary of Delta Lake, letting you know what it can do for you, why you might want to use it in customer implementations. We talked about how you could use Spark with um, Delta Lakes, showing you how to write that code and what you need to do to make sure that it ends up where you want it to be. We've looked at look, a pipelines integration with Delta and the caveats that you need to take a look at. And then we looked at serverless to see um, some of the things that were not available in the past that you can do now when it comes to Delta Lakes and with Synapse. And with that, I did leave um, a good 10 minutes or so to answer any questions that people might have about um, Delta Lake and integrating that with Synapse. So I will say that um, for most clients now, I am implementing Delta Lake um, because it just improves the performance of serverless and you know provides things that I think that really provide value. So if you are um, looking at doing a implementation where people is are primarily going to be using your um, flat file data as, as a query engine definitely want um, look at doing that in Delta Lake. 